guys, this is Mrs. Tyson. Welcome to Lesson 20, Day of Atonement. This is a super important lesson, so I'm so glad you're here. You should go ahead and get your packet out. It's just one page today, and then you have a little booklet. And we're going to go ahead and get started. Just a couple of reminders. Again, one, make sure you watch this video first before you do anything else. Um, two, fill out your exit ticket when you're done using the work that you write on your workbook and on your um, little packet, which today is just one page. And then make sure you come to the live stream, 1255 and 145. If you don't know how to get there, you can email me or text me, but it's also on Google Classroom. There's a link. Okay, let's pray. Please bow your heads, close your eyes, and let's go to our Lord. Lord, we're just so grateful that we are alive and well and that we can still study your word, even though we're all quarantined. God, we just pray that you will bless this time. And thank you so much for this special day that we have to learn about. Thank you that you took our sins away that day on the cross. Um, we love you, God, and we ask for help in understanding your word. In your name, amen. All right, let's dive in. We are in Module 3, God's Presence. We are going to practice our verse. Here it is. You can find this poster and the chant on Google Classroom for practice. Your quiz is tomorrow. Here's the chant. I'm just going to play it once. Feel free to play it again if you need it. Awesome. Just a reminder, you can replay the portion of this video if you need more practice or go to the Classwork tab on Google Classroom. Here's your pattern statement. If you don't know it by now, practice, practice, practice. You need it. You need to know it for tomorrow. A particular structure communicates a particular message. Write that down on your paper. And I'm going to keep going. If you need help or time, just pause it. Just a reminder, this is a structure of the book of Leviticus. It's like bookends. The front and the back of the text are, the first and last chapters are about rituals. Then as you move in, priest, purity, and the focal point is the Day of Atonement. It's the most important part. That's why it's in the very center. Here's our objective for today. We have two. One, you're going to read and annotate the text describing the Day of Atonement. We have a booklet for that. Two, you're going to create a question and answer set for the Day of Atonement. Um, and then you're going to write those in the exit ticket for today. Just a reminder, the setting is during the year Israel camped at Mount Sinai. And it's happening at the Tent of Meeting. God is calling to Moses from the tent. Moses is outside. God is inside. A review on those specific pieces of Leviticus starts and ends with ritual, beginning of the book, two types of offerings, thank you and I'm sorry, and then five specific sacrifices. At the end of the book, feasts are the ritual, remembering what God has done. There's seven specific feasts. Then we move into priests, uh, how to ordain them, and then there's standards. Then we move to purity, clean and unclean, and moral purity. Finally, the focal point, today's lesson, Day of Atonement. Let's watch this video. At the center of the book, we find the long description of one of Israel's annual feasts, the Day of Atonement. Odds are that not every Israelite's sin and rebellion would be covered through the individual sacrifices. And so once a year, the high priest would take two goats. One of these would become a purification offering and atone for the sins of the people. And the other was called the scapegoat. The priest would confess the sins of Israel and symbolically place them on this goat and then it would be cast out into the wilderness. Again, this is a very powerful image of God's desire to remove sin and its consequences from his people so that God can live with them in peace. The book concludes with Moses calling Israel to be faithful to all of the terms of the covenant, and he describes the blessings of peace and abundance that will result if Israel obeys all of these laws. He also warns them that if they're unfaithful and dishonor God's holiness, it will result in disaster and ultimately exile from the land promised to Abraham. Now, if you want to see how Leviticus fits into the big storyline, it's helpful to look at the first sentence of the next book of the Bible, Numbers. It begins, the Lord spoke to Moses in the tent. 
So we can see that Moses is now able to enter God's presence on behalf of Israel. The book of Leviticus, it worked. So despite Israel's failure, God has provided a way for their sin to be covered so that God can live with sinful people in peace. And that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. Awesome. Let's go to our next clip. Now, you probably noticed that they surround the very center of this book. And it's here that we find a really important ritual called the Day of Atonement. Yeah, so Israel's a big tribe now. And odds are there's a lot of sin happening that goes unnoticed that people are not dealing with. And so one time a year, the priests would take two goats. And one of those goats is killed. And its blood is carried right into God's presence where it symbolically covers or atones for Israel's sin. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Well, the meaning of the sacrifice, it's explained in the next chapter, where God says that the blood of a creature is its life. And so this goat's life is offered as a substitute. It's receiving God's punishment for Israel's sin so that the people don't have to. That leaves the second goat. Yeah, the priest puts his hands on it, and then he confesses all of the sins of Israel. It's like he's placing the sins on the goat. And then that goat gets cast out forever into the wilderness. It's called the scapegoat. Yeah, I've heard that word before. Yeah, it's this very powerful image of how God is graciously removing Israel's sin. But let's be honest, sacrifices in general seem so barbaric. We have to remember that in the ancient world, sacrifices were the main way of buying favor from the gods. But the problem was that those same gods, they're unpredictable, they're fickle, you never know if they're going to ignore you or they're going to turn on you. And so it's in this cultural setting that we see Israel's God as totally different. He does get angry about human corruption, but it is never arbitrary. And he loves people. So he provides this clear way for Israel to know with confidence that they are forgiven and that despite their corruption, they are safe to live near his presence. And so that makes the book of Leviticus actually a revolutionary statement in its day. So that's Leviticus. But Israel's still at Mount Sinai in the middle of the wilderness. They need a place to live. Yes, the land God promised to Abraham. And so the journey to that land is what the next book of the Bible is all about. One last video, guys. Let's explore what's supposed to happen on this day. Aaron, the high priest, is not allowed to enter the innermost sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, on any day except Yom Kippur. Aaron immerses himself in the ritual bath. He sets aside different animals for sacrifices and draws lots to determine which goat will receive the sins of the people and be sent into the wilderness and which will be sacrificed. He begins the sacrifices and sprinkles the blood in the Holy of Holies. He finishes the sacrificial rites, and then Aaron removes his separate priestly garments, bathes in the mikvah, and puts the white garments back on to remove the incense and finish the day's services. Two things to note uh, there, the Azazel, which is in our t scriptural text, is the same thing as a scapegoat. And Yom Kippur is another name for the Day of Atonement. I'm going to say that again. It's important to know. The Day of Atonement is also referred to as Yom Kippur, uh, spelled Y-O-M, new word, K-I-P-P-U-R. Before we close out today, here's a sermon excerpt from a man named Ray Dillard. Tim Keller, a, a very great um, author, speaker, uh, who's written a ton of great books. You guys should check it out. He um, retells this message that he heard once from his pastor, and Dillard was speaking about a prophecy from the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. And in this prophecy, Zechariah saw Joshua, who was high priest at the time, standing before the altar of God on the special day called the Day of Atonement. And this is what happened. I'm going to read it to you. You can follow along. You can close your eyes and listen. It goes like this. A week beforehand, the high priest was put into seclusion, taken away from his home and into a place where he was completely alone. Why? So he wouldn't accidentally touch or eat anything unclean. Clean food was brought to him and he'd wash his body and prepare his heart. The night before the Day of Atonement, he didn't go to bed. He stayed up all night praying and reading God's word to purify his soul. Then, on Yom Kippur, he bathed head to toe and dressed in pure, unstained white linen. 
Then he went into the Holy of Holies and offered an animal sacrifice to God to atone or pay the penalty for his own sins. After that, he came out and bathed completely again, and a new white linen was put on him, and he went in again, this time sacrificing for the sins of the priests. But that's not all. He'd come out a third time, and he bathed again from head to toe, and they dressed him in a brand new pure linen, and he went into the Holy of Holies and atoned for the sins of all the people. When the high priest went before God, there wasn't a speck on him. He was as pure as pure could be. Only if you understand that do you realize why the next lines of the prophecy in Zechariah 3 were so shocking. Zechariah saw Joshua, the high priest, standing before the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, but Joshua's garments were covered in excrement. That's poop. He was absolutely defiled. Zechariah couldn't believe his eyes. God was giving Zechariah a prophetic vision so that he could see us the way that God sees us. In spite of all our efforts to be pure, to be good, to be moral, to cleanse ourselves, God sees our hearts, and our hearts are full of filth. Well, that's not encouraging, but listen to this. All of our mortality, all of our good works don't really get to the heart, and Zechariah suddenly realized that no matter what we do, we, no matter what we do, you guys, we are unfit for the presence of God. But just as he was about to despair, Zechariah heard, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, See, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Listen, I am going to bring my servant, the branch. I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Zechariah probably couldn't believe his ears. He must have thought, wait a minute. For years we've been doing the sacrifices, obeying the cleanliness laws. We can never get the sin off ourselves. But God was saying, Zechariah, this is a prophecy. Someday the sacrifices will be over. The cleanliness laws will be fulfilled. Centuries later, another Joshua showed up. Another Yeshua. Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua. It's the same name in Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew. Another Joshua showed up. And he staged his own Day of Atonement. One week beforehand, you guys know this as Palm Sunday, Jesus began to prepare. And the night before, he didn't go to sleep. But what happened to Jesus was exactly the reverse of what happened to Joshua the high priest. Because instead of cheering him on, nearly everyone Jesus loved betrayed, abandoned, or denied him. And when he stood before God, instead of receiving words of encouragement, the Father forsook him. Instead of being clothed in white garments, he was stripped of the only garment he had. He was beaten and he was killed naked. He was bathed, too, in human spit. Why? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God clothed Jesus in our sin. He took our penalty, our punishment, so that we, like Joshua, the high priest, can get what Revelation 19, 7 through 8 pictures. Let us rejoice and be glad. Fine linen, bright and clean, is given to us to wear. Through, though Jesus Christ, at infinite cost to himself, sorry, through Jesus Christ, at infinite cost to himself, God has clothed us in costly, clean garments. It cost him his blood, and it is the only thing that can deal with the problem of your heart. Scholars, go ahead and complete your booklet, complete your packet. If you need help with your booklet, there's another video that reads through it and asks some questions. Use your answers to complete the exit ticket on Google Classroom. Please don't take a photo of your homework for Lesson 20. Just submit your exit ticket. Then save your yellow sheet for the final project. A quiz tomorrow. Practice your verse, guys. Love you. Praying for you. Have a great night. Bye-bye.